um, that we've been having ever since the beginning of the pandemic every Thursday. It started mm -hmm. off with uh, drama school trying to figure out what are we going to do? How are we going to respond to this time? How are we going digital? Should we? All of that existential stuff happen. The practical conversations happen. Uh, and um, after which, uh, can we uh, just, uh, if you're not speaking, if we can ask you to mute, please. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, after which, um, we got to a place where um, we actually, uh, Amy took over the conversations and basically uh, stoked about our responsiveness in this moment. And then later on, uh, Mwenya and Amgeni uh, joined. And by this point, we realized in general that we were talking about a world that is perpetually in a state of disruption, an ongoing disruptive state. And um, how do we respond to it? What do we do for, as theater makers, as theater teachers? What does theater do? So the, the scope and the, the territory that the conversations covered got wider and wider. And when Mwenya and Amgeni and Amy and I got together to do season two, we really thought about some of the themes that came out of season one. And the key ones came out, which was uh, planetarity, because we're all of one planet. This was especially inspired by a talk with Felipe Cervera from the first season. I think it was the second or third talk we did. Um, and all these talks are available on our website, Drama School Mumbai under the section conversations. Uh, and then plurality, as you see, you're witnessing it and it was a, there was a call for it uh, as opposed to globalization, which was more sort of um, homogenizing plurality seemed to be a, a, a conversation around us being able to live with difference, live with change, live with uh, in, a, in a state of mutual tolerance. Not even tolerance. Tolerance means I have to put up with you. Pluralism is beyond that. Uh, and possibility, which is, of course, why I'm here. And I'm, I'm, I'm truly here uh, because of the possibility. And I got, I, got mis, I got mistaken for a bit because when I first talked uh, to Ellen or thought of Ellen and Jay coming in, I thought about the fact that they at the City Company. They've been doing work with the Suzuki Company from Togo and with viewpoints training. And then they, they had this whole merge. They have a, both a history of cross-cultural practice. And I was on that whole intercultural jag to sort of figure out, well, where does plurality lie? Where does universality lie? How do we work with the differences? And how do we work with the similarities or with, how do we reach across the differences to find the universal truths? So that was really my initial impulse to reach out to Jayad and Ellen, uh, who Falguni will put their profiles in. I mean, their profiles are uh, illustrious to say the least. Um, but really what they do take, uh, speak of is a, is a great breadth of knowledge and experience of uh, which is what we're tapping into today. And we're really happy to have both of you here. So thank you for being here. But Ellen said something because uh, we've always had these lovely exchanges on email. And she basically said, uh, it is clear to us as theater makers that theater has a great repository of tools with which to keep the world healthy. And I just loved it. And, and I just thought, well, that is actually what we're trying to figure out. And one of the ongoing conversations that we're having is now, how do we take this time in this pandemic moment to realize what else theater can be for society? How can we contribute to the good, to the building, to the, to the making, to the creating, uh, to, 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 to leaving things better than we found it uh, as, as theater makers, uh, as pedagogues, as, as all of whom are gathered here. And so I really thought that's where we should start this conversation. So I will uh, leave it with Ellen uh, and then Jay Ed to maybe spend uh, five or 10 minutes each, maybe 10 minutes each as opening statements. Or I'll, I'll leave it to you how you guys want to run it, but a little bit of introduction, um, but really moving fluidly into thoughts so we can actually start the conversation. Um, and the other thing that whilst they're doing that, or even before that, uh, one of the things we're asking all of you in the ongoing conversations is, uh, I have a question that maybe you can respond to in the chat window is uh, a simple question. What, what, what of your practice or what of your intention going forward is changing um, because of what you have been picking up during these conversations? It would be really nice to know or hear from you if any of this huge discursive dialogue that we're having here is actually somewhere 
affecting and creating some kind of change in practice. That would be the, uh, an interesting first step. So let that happen, but uh, here we are. Um, Ellen, J. Ed, welcome. Thank you so much. And um, it, it's truly a great pleasure and honor to meet you, feel you, reach out and be together this morning for us here in New York. I'm zooming in from upstate New York. I left <clears throat> our apartment in Manhattan um, about a year and a half ago. I still go back down, but in the course of this time, the city company, we let our studio go in the city. Uh, we began to shed all of the trappings that come with being a theater company for 30 years. We began to give things away from our storage to people who might be able to use furniture um, and goods from that, from 30 years of a repertoire stored away, not doing us any good. Um, and it was a great time of mourning when that happened. I am very lucky, J. Ed and I have a place out of the city about three hours north. And this is a great privilege. I recognize that and all of the parts of my world that have allowed me to have this uh, place. We refurbished this old dilapidated barn and this became for me uh, where I met the world. It was the last thing I thought uh, years ago when we started to fix this place up that this is where I would meet as many people from around the world as anywhere. Um, we have, I also am on the staff uh, for about, oh God, 20 years now. I've been on the faculty of the Juilliard School of Drama uh, in New York. So I also go back down. I was one of two faculty members uh, at Juilliard that agreed to go back into Lincoln Center, uh, which looked a little bit like a spaceship. It was completely covered in plastic and roped off. I'm sure you'll recognize the environment. What that was a, one of um, high energy and certainly uh, stress from the students but always a place of great joy. It had turned into a very strange sci-fi setting. But I went back in for a variety of reasons uh, for the nature of what I do. And I was allowed full run of the theaters to distance and I began the work. But the bulk of also what I did with the city company was online. Um, I've had a, a world where I live in the horizontal and I live in the vertical. And for the duration of my life as a, as a uh, transmitter, this is what I've tried to uh, communicate to a young artist uh, for making purposes, which is to recognize things for what they are in the horizontal and see it as potential and material with which to make one's work. And I also have spent uh, over 40 years working with uh, Suzuki Tadashi, uh, the artistic director and founder of the Suzuki Company of Toga, which is located in the wild uh, mountains, the southern, essentially the Southern Alps on the Western coast of Japan up in a small village in the Toyama prefecture where they have lived and worked. Uh, you perhaps might know a little history about the Scott company, but that's a very curious vertical world for a Western middle-class woman to have landed in. And I have toured with them. I'm about to head into another tour coming in November. Uh, we are touring Indonesia. I am the only Western actor in their company. Um, and it's very strange. I, people always think I'm the tour guide when we land at the airport. <laughs> so uh, that's a very, very vertical world. If you know anything about the Suzuki training in terms of setting the body, the spirit, the mind against a set of criteria. 
and recognizing then where one falls within that criteria. It's not to make anyone look the same as the other, as in the um, corps de ballet. It's more to recognize the individuality in each person as they face the criteria and bring forward what's already there within the young artist, within the old artist, and bring it out into for expressive purpose. Um, it often is maligned and misunderstood. And I think that's why uh, Mr. Suzuki has asked me to be an ambassador for that work around the world for so many years, because people are so disappointed when I get off the airplane, <coughs> because they're expecting a uh, some kind of monk <laughs> or uh, some kind of priestess, I think. And it's just, again, just a white American middle-class woman, uh, essentially. And the work speaks for itself. Um, what I have found during this period, I think I'm perhaps like you, and I, I won't speak for my partner in crime here, J. Ed, um, and we have worked together in the city company for about 30 years, is, and I didn't know it early on, Who? how could we know it, um, that, that the work I'm able to communicate, and I'm in the middle of a, of a month-long intensive that's usually uh, on the campus of a small upstate New York college here uh, for, again, 30 years. We brought 60 people, 60 artists of all disciplines together for one month, trained and made original material in the afternoon, uh, attended symposiums, conversations, and lived together. That was all stripped away. We're online, and it's a little bit like I'm, I haven't been this happy in a year and a half. I, the first, I couldn't believe how the knots in this rope of my life were able to be handed through the screen, handed through the generosity of the artists gathered from all over the world. And they were able to grab these knots, and I didn't pull them. They pull. They are pulling themselves along, and the knots are the metrics. The knots are the point of view. The knots are the entry point into a way of thinking, into a way of receiving perception and appropriate response to the world, um, the horizontal, and then the metrics of that vertical, measuring the self against these really hard criteria where I can't, um, I can't make an adjustment on them. I'm not in the room with them in, in terms of three-dimensionality of their world. But what they're doing to come forward, their embodiment of the ideas in their bedrooms, in their kitchens, in their basements, is so moving to me. And I think there's something transpiring that is uh, very reaffirming for me. I'm not suggesting that anything I'm doing other than transmitting and, and being witness, um, and perhaps that's what we're able to provide right now. It is, as we've all learned, a place of great access. We can do better, you know. Um, we can just do better. Zoom is challenging for the non-hearing community. Uh, there is close captioning now, learning to work better this way. Um, and creating, as we have continued to create, as a place of great coming together, but also allowing these affinity groups of people who self-identify and need to connect with one another so that they can come together in the studio and be together with their own, you know, all together alone, um, which is a, a critical practice in the world right now. We are living here in the U.S. in <clears throat> a, a, a continued roiling time of uh, uh, a, a racial reckoning, 
with our past um, and a, a complete political upheaval. That is the part of this equation I don't know how to respond to yet both as an artist and as someone who walks into a room with people from all over the world, young and older. And I'm, I'm being quite frank with you. I know I have a body. I know I have a voice and I know how to breathe to get the voice out into the world like a seventh limb. You know, we work a lot, the idea of head, tail, arm, arm, leg, leg, and generating all that movement from the center of gravity and the voice being that seventh limb. Um, and that's what I'm working on right now in the studio with, with the artists that are gathered, which is still about 60, 60 artists. So it's just the administrating of it and making sure everyone gets in the right studio has been a, a, a not something I've solved. I have far smarter people around me helping get all the color coding and you click it and you're in the right studio. Um, but this idea of the necessity of the body and the whole body of getting people up into their spaces and creating these, creating a theater, creating a disciplined, focused, energized space around them, allowing them a transformative experience, which is the point of any artistic preparation. Um, and taking them through that has been, uh, I, I, I've been astonished by the ability for the artist to come and meet, maybe even more than halfway. I, I was thinking the other day, teaching through this medium has been, um, for me, so revelatory in terms of, and I'm sure you're finding it too, you have to be, you really have to boil things down to what it is you think, to what it is you feel, to what it is you know, be it right or wrong, you have to speak so clearly and boil off all of the anecdotal things. Um, and the silence on the other side is palpable until you learn to press against it and welcome it because you can feel the thinking, you can feel the breathing and, and carry on. Um, and I, I, we're now into the phase where we're making a great deal of work and the tools are all there. The frame is another piece of material. The frame is another, um, way of seeing and exploding the way we can work together uh, and and experiment exper a time of great experimentation um, so i can speak specifically about these two trainings that i teach but overall uh, i do want to speak from a place of positivity um, and goodness and that's coming from the people that I'm meeting. And I'm so deeply grateful to them. And, and this chance to tell you that message. I hope, I really hope with all my heart, you're experiencing the same. And I'm anxious to hear from you as well. I think Jay Ed? Great start. Jay Ed? Thank you, Ellen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, afternoon or evening, where you might be. As always, it's difficult to follow my... Uh, articulate and talented partner. Um, Ellen talks about how people are sometimes surprised when she gets off a plane um, and she's a white middle class woman. Um, and then they often are surprised that she's followed by a brown uh, male Chicano from South Texas. So I think we make a pretty um, pluralistic image as we walk off the plane. I'm going to talk a little bit about myself as a background to get to the um, topic material, which is quite fascinating, and Alan is so articulate about that. Um, I've been very lucky in my life. Uh, I never did theater until uh, not even university, because I didn't go to a university at first. I went to a college. Um, I went to a community college, which, if you know anything about the uh, educational system in the U.S., are two years 
locally based, low funded, mostly um, working class and lower students. Uh, I got interested in the theater class by accident. And so for me, art and theater are a gateway to education in the world. I would never have gone to university, even though I did go to a small university in South Texas where the majority of the students were uh, Latino, Chicano, like myself. But uh, art and theater were my gateway to the university. And so uh, it's very interesting that from starting community college, I am now a professor, um, head of graduate acting, and another title I can't yet officially tell you for a couple of weeks, um, that I am now a professor at one of the uh, leading research universities in the world, coming from a lower working class environment in South Texas, where the border is fluid. Uh, my family has been in Texas for over six generations, but the border didn't really exist for us. Half of my family spends half of the year in Mexico, half in Texas. As migrant seasonal working conditions happen, when the economy is good in the U.S., our relatives are welcome. When the economy is bad or there is a president elected who has a difference of opinion, immigrants are bad, a border is tried to be erected, and immigrants are pushed out. So um, I am bicultural, I am bilingual, I grew up speaking only Spanish until I started school. And now I'm a, again a professor at uh, UCLA. So for me, uh, this is a really great question because um, this idea of um, remote access and plurality is fascinating and something I've been um, dealing with for, as almost all of us, for the last year and a half. I've been teaching here, in, uh, instead of in Los Angeles at UCLA, I've been teaching here in upstate New York since last March, I think it is, March 2020. I've been teaching only remotely um, here. And um, it's been difficult. It's been very difficult for the students. It's also been difficult for the faculty and the staff. Uh, it'll probably be more difficult next year because our students are gonna be coming back on campus for the most part uh, if the spirits hold out. And they're gonna be hungry and demanding, rightfully so, things that were denied them for a year. Pardon. Um, and it's gonna be difficult for us to try to make that accessible to them uh, due to the limitations of the economy. And while I hope that soon the pandemic is if not over, at least lessened to the, to the point where we can all be in the room together, I think we can all safely say that most likely the economic repercussions are gonna last a lot longer. And that's gonna make it very difficult. So we're trying to learn at UCLA as we're learning with the city company, what are, are there benefits to remote accessible teaching, and if so, what might they be? So um, I've been very lucky since I started my career. I, I, would, I started as a writer and then quickly morphed to a performer because writing is lonely and singular. And when you're in the cast of a show that you've written, you have people around you, there's a community, it's a little more exciting. So, for, I was primarily a performer. I primarily spent most of my working life as members of, as a member of ensemble theaters, spending the beginning part of my career mostly in Chicano theater, which is a very politically based, community based form of theater that began as agitprop and then morphed into a more polished, multi varied way of looking at the problems of identity and social aspects in the Latino Chicano community. So I've been mostly working as an ensemble member. 30 years ago, I was quite lucky to meet Ellen Lauren and uh, Anne Bogart, who was one of the co-artistic founders along with uh, Mr. Suzuki Tadashi the, of the City Company started working with them both in uh, the William Inge play. You can't get much more American regional theater than William Inge's Picnic. Um, but we started working on that play. I found an accessibility and an interest to the type of work which I've always done, which is bodily based, physically based. And so I, by accident and luck, fell into um, working with Ellen and Anne, who was asked to join the company, and I've been working with them for over 30 years. 
For over 30 years, I've been very interested in the following. One is trying to find a type of theater practice and theater training that is objective as opposed to subjective. I find in the U.S. a great deal of actor training is very subjective. It's what the teacher like. It's what the guru thinks. It's their own particular style. Um, the Suzuki method is extremely, extremely objective. There are certain physical tasks you attend to. This is something that I've borrowed, as most of my lines are from Ellen. We don't know a lot about how Greek theater was performed, but we do know that they had the same body that we do. So that is our, that is our link and our connection to Greek performers, is we have the same body. Um, so w there's an objectivity to the Suzuki Company training that I found very thrilling. That married with the ensemble collaborative nature of the viewpoints for me became a very holistic way of working. They're very different, these trainings, but I think they're symbiotic and they support each other. And what I found immediately and continues to thrill me both as a performer and as an educator, and I never thought I would say that, but yes, I am now an educator. I am now a tenured professor at one of the greatest research universities in the world, is that it's very empowering. Um, in the U.S., in my opinion, in my opinion in the U.S., um, a lot of performance and performers have lost a sense of virtuosity and of training towards virtuosity. There is virtuosity, but for example, most actors in the U.S., not all, but most actors are interested in television and film, even though the training is still somewhat theater-centric. And so most of the virtuosity, in my opinion, in film and television is virtuosity of the camera, virtuosity of the cinematography, virtuosity of the sound designer, virtuosity of the director. And the actor is a interesting package that is made to look even more so. The Suzuki method and the viewpoints give back some of the power to the actor to make stronger artistic statements and choices. And that to me is very thrilling. Um, as a person of color, as a multi-hyphenate uh, actor, I started, as I said, primarily as a writer. I've been a, mostly a performer for the last 40 years. And in the last 12 years or so, I've become, again, mostly a writer, director, and professor. These tools for me that I offer to our students, and again, I'll keep mentioning UCLA, and I'll talk a little bit more about the city company, because UCLA is the University of California, in the city of Los Angeles. So it is a university in a, in a pluralistic community of California, in a hyper pluralistic community of Los Angeles. So for me, these tools are a way of empowering younger artists to tell their own stories. My job is not to tell artists the stories they, to, they should tell, but to try to give them the tools to tell their stories. And I'm, that, that is my primary interest nowadays. As a member of the city company, we have found, as Ellen was talking a little bit, how our company is changing, how we've had to let go of our studio. We found, and it's interesting because I would say maybe this started to happen before the events of the last two years in the U.S., which has empowered the U.S. to necessarily look at, with a long overdue, open-eyed gaze at um, the structure of power and hierarchy, not only in the country, but specifically also in art making and theater and filmmaking practices. Our company was starting to examine that uh, as well. Going into the future, knowing that our company might be changing, what, are we gonna, what do we do with these tools that we believe in? So we, we started actively, and it was not easy, actively looking at a way to share our vocabulary, to share our training with a larger pluralistic community. So um, Ellen and I have been teaching all over the world for the last at least 20 years. Ellen probably longer as a member of the Suzuki Company. But for the last 20 years of, as members of the City Company, we've been uh, performing, but even more training and teaching all over the world, um, mostly at the beginning to a more Eurocentric uh, community. But we've started more outreach to every continent in the world, except yet to the African uh, continent. 
Um, we've done some work in Asia, mostly uh, in East Asia, a little bit in South Asia. Um, we've worked all over Latin America, but we still need, uh, we still do not, do not have access to uh, the African continent yet. Why is that important to me? Because I think these tools are wonderful as a way to empower artists to tell their own stories. It's not to tell people in any continent what stories they should tell or even how they should tell them, but to give them the tools to re-embrace a sense of virtuosity and to tell their own stories. What have we learned from Zoom? For the last year and a half, I've been forced to teach from Zoom. And like a lot of us, I went kicking and screaming into this little box. It was very difficult. It's also, it was also very interesting in my classes at UCLA. You could see immediately a sense of class and of economic position. I would see some classes because it was a primarily a movement classes where I would say, let's start examining the space that we're in. How can we break outside the tyranny of this box, of this frame? Turn your camera around. Show us where you're working. And some students would turn the camera around and you'd see a beautiful, huge glass wall with a beautiful, huge, manicured uh, lawn and beyond outside. And then there'd be some people in class where once or twice during class, you would see a mother or grandmother walking by, literally with a basket of laundry. Or if someone would unmute to speak in class, you would hear children speaking in the background. I have a student who just wrote me a beautifully moving final paper for a viewpoints class that I taught, and she was talking about kinesthetic response, responding to an outside uh, influence. She said that very often, her kinesthetic work, even though we, we did not know it, those of us watching her on Zoom, was to the noise of the children that her mother babysits as a living in her small house. So there is this sense in Zoom, which is a kind of a dichotomy of the remote accessibility, making it accessible to people everywhere. There is that potential, and yet there is also the financial drawbacks. Some people are on a computer. Some people are on a small telephone, and that makes a difference. So for me, as we continue to go forward, I want to see how I can continue, and we're trying to do this at UCLA, of making equipment available to students uh, that they can use or borrow so that they can have um, a little more of a, if not equal, a little less unequal level technical ability. Because then, of course, we know that we're also limited by the amount of broadband that someone has in their house. So, how do, how do we deal with that? But yet, at the same time, it does make it possible for students who are not able to come to the university, uh, whether because of public transportation in their city or they don't have a car, or people who live in the countryside are able to take classes. So that's, those are both the positive aspects as well as some of the difficulties, as well as the the nature of how we have to change what we're teaching. I find that myself in Zoom, I teach about two-thirds of the material in the amount of time that I have, that I would normally would, and it takes me twice as much effort, energy, and preparation. I find I have to be careful not to get too excited, as my partner might text me and speak too quickly. I need to try to, to calm my chi down, be a little more articulate, and yet, at the same time, I need to reach through the box to the students and bring them with me. I will say, uh, respectfully, not disagreeing, even though Ellen and I do have great, lively conversations. So I'm not disagreeing. I'll say a yes and in terms of... Um, I'm unmuting now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of uh, hearing impaired, we currently have a hearing impaired participant in our summer intensive. And one of the interesting things is the closed captioning allows us to make it accessible to her without her or our company having to employ a translator, which is an economic issue. If, if we had someone who was signing for her, or if she had someone, that would be great, but that's an economic issue. The closed caption might not be the best option. It might mistranslate some things, but it makes um, 
economic availability. And I think the closed captioning is also good if I am teaching at some place where they speak English, but my dialect, the speed of my, of my, uh, of my articulation or my regionalisms as a Texan from the southern part of the U.S., more accessible. They can look at the transcript afterwards and my attempt to be charming, my euphemisms might be a little less accessible. They can look at that later and um, have a way of reaffirming what I th was hopefully trying to say. Does that make sense, ladies and gentlemen? So I think that I think there are some positives to this including not only with the hearing impaired, um, but also with students who might not understand what I am trying desperately to articulate to them and the ability to share the sense of empowerment. I think for me, that's the most important thing. Um, I'll, I'll end with this for now. Thank you. I, I'm gonna say one last thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll say this one last thing. Very often in my classes at UCLA, I ask the students, um, have you, am I the first uh, Chicano or professor of color you've had? And this is at the University of California in Los Angeles. And it's always striking to me how many people say yes, or how few people say they've had a professor of color or specifically in Los Angeles, a Latino Chicano professor before. So I think even just that, as many Educators, as we can put in front of them, that reflect the reality of the student taking the class, to me, that's huge and instrumental. And I also think that remote accessibility uh, is a large part of that. That's all I will say for now. I'm sorry if I rattle on. Thank you, Ellen, for starting us off so well. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you for both of... Uh, thank you for that. I think those are, both of you have left uh, us with lots of lots of possible launch points and places to, to sort of take this conversation. Um, and I don't even know where to begin. There is also some very interesting questions already in the chat window that Ellen has provoked about frames uh, and frame being material, which we'll get to in a second. I'm gonna hold, put, that, put a pause on that, but guys, uh, feel free. We're gonna raise hands and go off mic and just turn this into a conversation amongst the whole room. It's, Think of it not as a panel discussion with two people on stage, but us all sitting around in a circle having a cup of coffee together. But Ellen, I'm just gonna uh, provoke actually both of you because uh, um, there is this thought that uh, you talked about Chicano theater, how it was politically agit prop and then went on to a more refined sort of search for identity, uh, J. Ed, uh, and how art and theater were your gateway to, you know, it's the beginning of your story to education, et cetera. And, Ellen says that I have this voice, I have this body, I have these limbs, I have all of this. But in the middle of this, when we talked about how can theater heal the world, you also said pointedly, Ellen, that we're in a state of political disruption, which I, I don't know what to make of right now. I don't know how to respond to it. And it's almost like, if I'm gonna say, like, yeah, I've walked, into the, walked onto the planet with a first aid kit, but I don't know what the injuries are that need tending to. I, you know, it, something like that. So that's one thing. So I'm just going to put that on the back burner for now because it's more of a, a kumbaya type of question. Um, but I do, uh, but also building on something that Ngeni and uh, we have been talking about is this sense of radical intimacy. And Jayad, you kind of described it towards the end of, you know, what your experience of Zoom teaching has been. But Ellen, you so eloquently talked about it in terms of knots as well and how they reach forward to pull the knots. But, and I've been wondering about, is that good enough for us to, I think we've had a lot of conversations about whether this digital space is a substitute for the in-presence space, et cetera. So I'm not sure if we should go there. It's not, I agree. I don't think anyone in the room thinks it is, but the accessibility thing um, being such a huge thing and this idea of giving people the tools with which to find their own voice, et cetera, is that, if that's the place of healing, then, then if that's where the starting point is, where by giving people these creative tools. So that's where I'm thinking, and that's my sort of thought on this. But I'm also, um, uh, I think, I'll, let's go to J. Ed's question and uh, Umgeni's question around the frame. Sorry, not J. Ed, Kamili's question about the frame and Umgeni's question about the frame. So 
Kamili and Umgeni, if you Kamili first, Umgeni next, if you can just start off with your notions about the frame, and then we can um, we can take the conversation from there, and then we'll go to uh, Amy's next question. Yes. Oh yeah, I'll just keep it really simple. Yeah, I was curious about when you talked about the frame and um, <clears throat> excuse me, when you uh, is there anything that Zoom can do? I wonder if any of these technologies can do. If anything, these artists, can, uh, us artists, the trainers can do to kind of help Zoom help us. Just curious. Well, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind and uh, is I wish Zoom. <laughs> whoever Zoom is, <laughs> would figure out a remote, turn your camera off. This, it, it sounds pretty simplistic. And nice to meet you, Camille. Um, I went to Temple back when you had to kill what you ate. So I know Philly. <laughs> yeah, I went to Temple <laughs> as an undergrad too. So <laughs> brother, sister. <laughs> um, but you know the the idea of an entrance the idea of an exit which um exists in this medium as much as it exists in a studio or on a stage is corrupted with this idea you know you can see a student they're like trying to get their camera off uh or in right now we're working on um uh the theme this summer is are uh, we usually sorry i'll back up a little bit the city company when we do our intensives we throw into the pot the next upcoming production and of all freaking things we're going to be doing a production of christmas carol so then we boiled that down because that's just so you know eurocentric to the idea of ghost stories and so they're creating compositional material online for us they're beginning to show them of telling ghost stories I and mean, they're spectacular what they're what what they're doing they're they're mind-blowing what these people aren't doing and they're very analog you know it's just really good storytelling depth of field but the one thing that's they're having trouble with is making those entrances and exits because you can't black out you can't you've got to come forward or in an open improvisation uh, in viewpoints, you know, you can't, you can't enter and exit um, very well. And that, and that's, I think that would be really, really helpful. In terms of the rest of the frame, I don't, what, what are you finding in your studios? Are you finding that students are experimenting with moving frame or uh, or virtual backgrounds. I find virtual backgrounds to just be so creepy. I don't know <laughs> how anybody else feels, but you know, don't be doing that. Doesn't look good. And half of you disappears <laughs> or, or comes in and yeah, it's so janky in terms of that. And, and I know a lot of students had fun with it early on, you know, with the planets behind them or a floating bowl of cereal or something. But once we kind of got through that and God, thank you that we could play around. Um, now it's the use of it and it's still three dimensional space or the not, you know, the nine quadrants of space. For me, it's temporal and spatial is how to use the frame. And I'm not sure any kind of technology, but I really mean that, Camille. I'm not sure um, because I'm not, uh, I, I frankly have, have done very, very little work on a frame in, as an actor. Uh, it's the really been, The yeah. reason I was asking too, is just because I'm worried that Zoom will then come up with some brand new thing that'll literally park right in the middle of all of us and say, now we can use it. Yeah. And it's, it'll be completely for us theater folks, unmagical, yeah. unrealizable, and it'll just yeah. be like backgrounds, right? Where we just kind of get out of here, kind of thing, you know? I, I, I'm right with you. I agree. And you know somebody's, I mean, half of Zoom is so interesting because it's really, I mean, it's pretty amazing that I woke up this morning and I'm, we're all meeting. We know that. But it's really made for corporate, corporate um, situations, and and what we have done 
I feel, and not necessarily, I mean, we, as I'm reaching through to you, is just try to keep it real. So I worry that any kind of additional um, bells and whistles that Zoom might come up with is, is going to mess it up. Right now, it's just a place to meet. And this is maybe what I mean by the repository. It the uh, We just have to keep getting together and slamming ourselves up against one another philosophically, right? Spiritually, emotionally, and even physically. And I don't mean, obviously, co contact. Um, but we've, we, we all know that the, the physical transcends. And I think we have, as theater artists, made a Herculean effort through this year and a half to keep the body awake and alive. Um, and so, yeah, I would resist it as well. I think it would just be some, some like a bad, uh, going through that period of bad set design that we, we suffered through, you know, and then realized we didn't need all of that. Yeah. May I jump in for a second, Ellen? I'm, again, I'm going to respectfully disagree with my partner God in this it. case. I, I think there's two issues. Yes, there are technical uh, issues that we hope Zoom will make better. Uh, that's going to happen. For me, there's two things to think about. This is such a great question, Camille. Thank you. Uh, is that one, if there was one thing I would ask Zoom to do, because they're making so much damn money off of the whole world, is make make the accessibility free to more people. They're making enough money off, off of corporations. They, this limit of how long you can stay with smaller groups, there are community college or, or, or community groups that could benefit by more broad uh, accessibility. Also, of course, technical issues such as finding a way to have better uh, visibility via telephone or people with lower broadband because not everybody has that. But aside from that, I'm going to say this, and I, this might be a little, um, no, I don't want to say radical, it might be a bone of contention. I really do think we have to embrace what it is. We, we, we have to say, this is, this is what it is. And really, our students, our younger people, they were doing this before the pandemic and before Zoom. Our students are on TikTok. Before they were on TikTok, they were on Instagram. Before they're on Instagram, they're making YouTube. So we, we have to accept that. We have to say, though, how can they do this better? And how can that lead them into wanting to work in person? Because they're watching TV and they're going to the movies a lot more than they're going to the theater. But how can we use those things to bring them to the theater? How can we? So at UCLA, um, it, it's a multi it's a multidisciplinary program it's all about content creation so we have a class at ucla where students learn how to and i'm always behind the curve on um on, on terminology on how to use new social media platforms to make their work how many students are starting and now the students in the class are doing tiktoks which are way too small but how do they start to do small things on YouTube that then someone sees and picks up. How did Lena Dunham start? Uh, 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 Donald Glover is a genius. How do, how do, we, take, how do we take the, the limit? Because as theater artists, I think the great thing that theater artists have more than anybody is that we're really great with obstacles. You know, if it's a theater that doesn't have a, back, a walk around, you got to build it into the show. You walk through the audience or someone runs across the stage. So we're really great at making limitations obstacles and obstacles are what gives us conflict and conflict in theater is art so we have to somehow find the limitations of this medium and use it to our advantage so i i, I don't want to let go of studio classes i can't wait to get back but for example i teach a class in chicano theater and i found that um breakout rooms were interesting in this aspect that it enabled me to quickly go okay we're breaking up into groups of five Here's a topic, you can discuss it, and then after 15 minutes, you elect one person in your group who's gonna come in and give a short report on what your group decided. So I'm proposing next year to teach the class hybrid, so one day a week, we're in the studio all together sharing the space, and then one day a week, 
we are going to be remote because that way, instead of me going, okay, we're not going to break out into small rooms and we lose half the class time going to another space and coming back, I can quickly do that. So I don't want to, does this make sense, Camille? I don't want to lose the sense of being in the room together with them, but I've got to accept that it did make some things more accessible. It also means some of our students who cannot afford to come to class because they have to work can, on their lunch hour, take a class from their phone. So I, yeah. I, I don't like Zoom. I really don't. I don't like being in a box, but I'm trying to figure out a way of, of accepting the limitations and using them to our advantage to tell better stories and to help our students. Thank you. OK. Um, I mean, it just reminds me of what Helen talked about. I mean, Ellen talked about so beautifully at the beginning about the horizontal axis being recognizing things for what they are and starting there. And then looking at we're discovering what the vertical possibilities are in this space, which is this whole conversation sounds like that. Uh, Amy, I, I think that's a really great question. And it also plugs into something that we were talking about, about systems of training that are very rigid versus fluid. And do you, do you want to just sort of put words to that, Amy? Yeah, sure. I, I spent so long composing my message. <laughs> um, it's fantastic, <laughs> but I need to hear you say it. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, no, I, I, it's a really interesting because I've uh, I've had long interviews with um, Norman and Ellie and Camille about the neutral mask in the um, the lineage of the Jacopo and Suzanne Bing and, and Jacques Lecoq. Uh, the noble or neutral mask. <clears throat> and when I hear you talking, Ellen, about um, the encounter between the uh, individual and the rigorous form, that really strikes a chord. That sounds a lot like what the neutral mask is. Essentially, it's a kind of a discipline that can bring out something in a performer. Um, it doesn't really have to be justified in any other way. It could be a you know, tea ceremony, or it could be you know, motorcycle maintenance, or it could be, um, uh, you know, it could be at any task that is rigorous. Um, however, it does seem that in theater training, certain aesthetics get prioritized. Simplicities, uh, symmetries, uh, certain states of energy. I mean, these are kind of, they're given a kind of reverence um, where, you know, other trainings wouldn't be considered uh, to give people um, a valuable st uh, performative state where in fact, it's just might be a different aesthetic. So I'm just uh, obviously forms cast shadows, um, and I'm just I'm just curious about how you and Jade think about the the shadow that's cast by by the aesthetic of of a rigorous training. That's a that's extraordinary. I'm a little intimidated by you, Amy. I, I, wow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> But um, so forgive me, I, I perhaps can't come up to the eloquent question uh, and, and brain you have. Uh, I was an athlete as a young person. I was an equestrian. I was on the junior Olympic team, obviously very highly trained. Training was my life, the rigor of uh, the Olympic Committee is such a, as it is. Um, and I was drawn to the Suzuki training, just as she, animal to animal. I just liked it. It just was, for me, it was fun. And, um, and then something in the back of my mind knew that it was also the alchemy of it was working to, and I finally felt, oh, I'm home. I'm home. I'm not, I, I finally have found a place where my energies and um, my habits and my skills and my taste and my, who I am began to find a place where all of those things were moving towards expressive purpose. And, and then I worried for a while, oh, am I learning a style? Am I learning, are these shadows taking me into a, uh, an appropriation culturally of a place in myself? And that was really quickly put aside uh, because I also met Anne 
and Bogart, and we began to experiment with the collision between <clears throat> And and first, let me clarify, the Suzuki training is by no means like any great training, by no means to dictate a style. It's really foundational. You can do multimedia, puppetry, videography, anything. It's just a foundational way of, of being in the world that makes who you are a little bit better, <laughs> right? Um, but meeting Anne and beginning then to to cross uh, and 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 work with the viewpoints and research that work as we continue to do because it's not it's a slippery slope as we know. Uh, but what we we found the chocolate and the peanut butter, so to speak, where that where they intersected that sweet spot is what on any given day in terms of communicating to an artist in my own practice you're looking for. And that doesn't cast shadows, that opens up the box and lets the light in. That isn't about uh, um, any, uh, how, how can I explain it? it? That's not about any kind of look or feeling or recognizing the work that's coming out of, of this. I would say, if anything, in my experience, at least, there's no such thing as viewpointing. It's not a verb. It's simply uh, perception. That there's no such thing as uh, performing in a Suzuki style, perhaps if you're working for Mr. Suzuki. And so the shadows of it maybe are spiritually in the sense of allowing an artist to open up their aperture about what their own personal criteria is when they look at work, when they make work, when they work with others. It's about sharing language that I can have a student in New York immediately meet somebody from Jakarta. And because they both shared a two week workshop, they they can speak together and make work. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I, I really think that the idea of a, a, sh a shadow is the thing that we're trying to figure out how to keep from it catching us. Um, uh, other than the idea of this, the whatever is left over from being marinated inside of a training, whatever sticks for each individual, um, whatever allows their potentiality to come out, uh, their centering in the world, their sense of self, their sense of, oh, we're going to go into the studio and we're going to try to make a model society. It may be about a family that's all at each other, other, other's throats, but that's our task, as we would say, you know, I'm, I'm, a model society. And, and again, when I say the theater is the repository for these things. It, it it's it's to it's to create that a, a way to be together. That's better. Over and over and over and over. Um, yeah, and, and and personal taste is that is that is that a shadow? Is that a is a shadow wrong? Maybe I'm misinterpreting that shadow dictates something that smacks of uh, uh, a style that that somebody's not freed from. And I really, really uh, feel that that's what we're trying to resist and get away from, certainly, I would hope. So, well, may, may I respond? Yes. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, Amy, for the question. Uh, Ellen is so eloquent about philosophy. I'm going to what I think I heard in your question from you and your colleagues uh, is something she and I have talked about. I'll be a little maybe more specific to what I think I understood of your question. And it's a word that this, you mentioned the word rigor, and I think that's a huge issue to deal with. I know Ellen and I, and to a certain extent in our company, we're talking a little bit about this idea. There are always isms in this country. The new ism is ableism. 
You know, is it is this is it is the rigor of our work uh, ex exclusionary? And I think it's a really interesting question. I think you have to ask yourself, what is it, what is it that you're trying to do and why are you doing it? Who are you doing it for? I think it's a great question. For myself, uh, she meant, Ellen mentioned uh, uh, her being an athlete. Not everybody is destined to play basketball in the NBA. Not everybody is meant to dance ballet uh, uh, with ABT or sing opera at the Met or play rock guitar at, uh, uh, at uh, Madison Square Garden. Uh, but I think everybody can play basketball in their backyard or down at the, at, the, at the playground, as I did when I was a kid. Everybody can sing around the campfire or sing at family gatherings in Spanish with the guitarra. I think that's all great, but what, what, is, it, what is it that you're trying to do and why? So for me, as a, as a teacher, there's a certain thing I'm aspiring to. I'm, I'm aspiring to give people voices. Um, if someone takes the training that I offer them and they're able to have the time, the interest, and the ability to translate that into opening it up to a community that they think needs it, I think that is wonderful. I don't feel that that's exclusionary on my part. Um, I, I, am, I am offering it at a particular level, uh, which you could say is a sense of enablism, but part of my job is also to teach people to use this work, and that using the work might mean that they make work, or using the work might mean they're going to use it to try to make it even more accessible that I'm trying to do to another community. So I think that it's important that I tell this to my students all the time. You don't ever have to do the Suzuki training when you finish school or when you finish training with, you, with the city company. You might never ever want to do the Suzuki training again. And why would you? It's difficult and physically taxing and it's painful in a way sometimes because we use muscles we're not used to. However, I would ask you to think about finding a discipline you can devote your life to. Whether it's writing down your thoughts every day, whether it's doing quiet, thoughtful meditation, Whatever it is, as an artist, find a discipline you can devote yourself to. And I think, we can, I think you can do that for everybody. I'll be very honest, I, I, I made a mistake because as, as theater artists, aren't we lucky? We're, I think the thing about theater artists is we continue to learn. Every time you work on a play, you have to learn about that play. So you learn a whole new culture, you learn a whole new world, you learn a new way of speaking, which is the way that playwright speaks. So as theater artists, we continue to evolve until we die and then someone posts our picture in memoriam. So I think, I think we can do that as theater artists. What, I'm, what I've learned is about five, six years ago, at recruiting for the MFA acting program at UCLA, a, a, a person came in in a wheelchair and they were really talented, but I was worried, how do I make the training accessible to them? How do I, how do I, make, how do I join them? Because it's about recruiting a cohort that's going to work intensely as an ensemble for three years. How do I include this person and not make, that, not, make, not make the next three years about taking care of that person? I'm still grappling with that. If I had the chance to, to, to recruit that person now, I would probably take the risk. Five years ago, I didn't feel I was up to taking the risk. I, I worried about the financial aspects of it. I worried about the accessibility of the, of the training spaces, and I worried about, about it unbalancing it, because a lot, a lot of the casting of the cohort is how do we balance the cohort out. So um, there, there is that learning, and so I, I am still grappling with how to make it, um, how to include more people, but at the same time, I, I want to do that without losing the sense of rigor. I might need to adapt the sense of rigor, but there has to be a sense of rigor, because I'm teaching uh, it's a professional training school, and I don't think there's anything wrong with a, a community training at a community center at a community college where I started. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's either or. So I just think we have to be very clear about who we're trying to reach and why are we trying to reach them. Uh, but it is a continuing conversation. It is. And I still think about that young man. Thank you. Kunal, you had a question? Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, just thanks, quick, thanks. quick thing, quick thing. We're coming on to ten past the hour. So at fifteen past, sorry, well, forty-five past the hour for most people. Fifteen past the hour for us in India. Um, that's when we sort of close down the formal part of the room. 
but also I feel like this conversation is just on the cusp of getting really started. So there is a, a, a 45 minute after party water cooler conversation. Jared and Ellen have given us two hours of their time, so that should do it. So just without further ado, I know that we've got Kunal, Umgeni, and then we're probably going to go to the unrecorded session of the con part of the conversation where everyone can, this really can genuinely be unmoderated and everyone can step in. So Kunal, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I had a wonderful opportunity to uh, be in a classroom of viewpoints with uh, Dr. J. Paul Skelton. Uh, he has been uh, with the city company for a long time. And he creates this really wonderful atmosphere in the classroom where the tools of the viewpoints are not the end, not the goal, uh, but they provide a vocabulary for exploration and discovery. So in the atmosphere, the students uh, almost become like a scientist uh, exploring their own creativity uh, through the vocabulary. So how uh, do we make this atmosphere on, over Zoom? Oh, um, well, the viewpoints are, are just a, a, a lens to look at what is there and to discover one's own response to the world around you. And so there are these identifying words that break and, and this is the work innovated by Mary Overly, who passed away last summer. Um, certainly Mary stands on other shoulders of giants. Passed through to Anne and City Company as we've continued our research. So I just want to be clear and make sure Mary, Mary's name is said, and my colleague Anne Bogart, and all my colleagues in the City Company. Uh, and we have had the great privilege to be in studios with thousands of artists and simply putting labels to the um, temporal and spatial issues of architecture and repetition, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I won't teach you a class. We could do that. That'd be fun. Yeah. But what it allows is, and you can do this, we're doing it now, I'll do it in about two and a half hours is is if you put if you help someone simply change their perception and let things come to them then they're receiving the news of a difference they're they're receiving the world around them and then their own perception of themselves and the possibilities of response come into play and so what you're really watching is the, the flowering of the individual and there is uh, there is no good no bad no right no wrong um there are degrees of profundity perhaps as mr suzuki would say but the viewpoints is a it is really truly a purely horizontal world where the improvisations where the um research and you you said this beautiful word is that's what it is you're getting a student in a position of putting on their lab coat and going into their own room, going into their own life, their own emotional state, their own sense of what story is, and researching it and finding out to their own delight what's actually already there, um, not putting on any kind of uh, style or theater game it's much more sophisticated than that and, and a deeply concentrated space where the individual is fully allowed to be. And there are so few forums, there are so few places for that in the world to come with, um, you know, beginner's mind and really practice and find one's own sense of humor and taste uh, and, and do that in collaboration, when I say all alone together, I mean you're in collaboration with everybody else going through that same thing and then coming together um, and, and processing what you've been through as a human being. And I, I don't think, and I'm really trying not to blow smoke up anybody, I don't think I've ever been in a session at the end where people didn't feel reified, didn't feel renewed didn't feel like they could go on and 
you know, pay that forward in some ways. Make the theater better as a community, as a city state, as a citizen of theater, to take on the responsibilities of it, which is to be fully present, kind, sharp, right? Listen, see, receive, perceive. So um, when you have that along with a body that's trained to breathe better and hold still and anchor and plug into Mother Earth, um, to notice, to be able to project energy, to concentrate, to deal with the invisible world and things that are usually unconscious brought to the consciousness. When you have these two things working in tandem, you are watching um, a human being along with their own cultural background, which are, which are so uh, necessary in the room. You, you really are watching a full fruition of somebody as they come through. So um, for me, I'm so glad you've had this experience. Come play. I'd love to work together, uh, do it. Because we can. We can walk in the room right now and make something or be together and do our research together and then have a coffee and be friends. <laughs> so thank you so for the question. It's the, last, it's the last few minutes, so I'm going to leave it with Omgeni's question uh, or Omgeni's remarks. And then, Omgeni, do you think you can close us out into the after party as well? Sure, maybe. Hello. Thank you so much for all of that really kind of rich thinking. Um, I'm kind of obsessively stuck on this idea of the frame. Um, and it was going to be a question, but I think I've come to the realization um, about my own kind of pedagogic, critical, ethical investments, um, you know, when I make choices on how to teach, and especially with this challenge, right? And I've been wondering more and more whether it's not this tension between the kind of laminated surface that that these kinds of devices and scenarios produce. So you don't, we, we kind of miss the details that sit just outside of the frame, right? Um, Zoom, when you enter into this kind of environment or any other kind of digital environment, I think it has a way of, of quite forcibly bracketing out everything outside of it. And I think in those moments, you might forget that we're all sitting in very specific contexts. So the tension between that, that kind of bracketing, erasing, laminating effect that these kinds of devices, surfaces, interfaces have, and the labor of recognizing that frame as a frame. And I think I work in ways to try and help students, not just on Zoom, but in the everyday kind of in real life practice of performance, to recognize that everything we're doing is a practice of framing. Um, mm -hmm. We are bracketing out an experiential space um, a conceptual space where we're agreeing to hold things still for a moment um, in order to engage with an idea, with a perspective, or whatever it might be. But I'm always trying, I think, to get them to recognize the multiple kinds of, and unequal forms of labor mm. that it takes to produce that frame and stabilize mm. that frame. So mm. that even when we're coming into this laminated space, if there's a way to help us recognize all that is beyond the edges of this frame, um, then I can't enter into this discussion without recognizing the individual humanity of the people with whom I'm engaging. Yeah. Because I'm always thinking about the context and the different kinds of, I guess, routes that they've respectively taken to arrive here in the first place. And I think it connects to what Jay Ed was saying right at the beginning about maybe just the practice of, you know, taking the camera and looking around the room as well, just to help us recognize that this is a device that emplaces us, but in this kind of non-space. And maybe what we're trying to find is a way of recognizing that practice of being emplaced by this device. Yeah, uh, it, it's a good lesson, isn't it? Because it's, uh, even as you're pointing at, when a, when a young artist or young participant or I, I don't know the language that you prefer to use. Um, some people are getting rid of the word student, I know. Um, but when they walk in a studio, it's the same. The frame is around them. We, 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 
we often already have put a frame around somebody and and you just so beautifully said opening up that frame of how did they get here <laughs> you know and and w- yes and 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 what's really there what 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 who are you who are you uh what what virginia wolf says it is so difficult to describe any human being and just keeping that in mind for and and not making any judgments about how that person it learns everyone learns at a different rate of speed i'm a very slow learner i'm a little dyslexic and i pick up choreography i pick up movement sequences and rules very slowly um you know and i, I and i realized i wasn't I wasn't looking at a young person through the, my very own lens. I had mm-hmm. framed them. They're young, they're here, they want to learn, they're going to slam up against all this stuff. And I really, I really had to have a talking with myself. And it really it has been through Zoom and this thing you're pointing at that I recognized how I've been doing that in my studio and all those assumptions, because studios are frames. They're just boxes, you know, they're the same thing. Thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> You're an amazing teacher. <laughs> they're lucky to have you there. Oh, I hope so. They may argue differently. <laughs> That's what we all think about our students. <laughs> uh, at least me. And as a passing out kind of thought, the other thing that I'm trying to grapple with in relation to that is I, I kind of always talk about using what's within reach because that tells us a lot, again, about you know, the, the perspective from which we each individually come. So I use the limitation of restraint in projects specifically to force students to work with what's immediately around them. Um, yeah, sure, you can have all the bells and whistles, but I'm more interested in what's on the table in front of you. Yeah, you um, know, there's... It, it, it's that that idea i'm sorry to interrupt it's just that just sparked this, that image of you know this the story of less 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 it's something Anne said not long ago in re- a rehearsal um and it was in reference to us having to rehearse through zoom which we started to do and we were all like how the hell do you do this but she said you know in in um it's been recorded the prisoners of war separated from one another and their solitary cells worked out these the taps to one another and survived through tapping um, on the wall next to them and survived for many, many years communicating just, just with the, you know, the limitations of communication of human survival minimized to such an extent. She said, we're tapping. That's all we're doing right now. We're just tapping. And we're trying to hear one another and make a, an alphabet and thus a language from these taps, just from one tap, the next, and figuring it out together. You know, it was so moving to, uh, to us. She has a way of doing that, <laughs> organizing it. But thank you, Ongeni. So I'm going to, yeah, I'm totally agreeing with what uh, Kamili is saying in the chat window. I am going to close out and say thank you, Ellen J. Ed, formally, for being here, making time for this. I think on behalf of all of us, we're really happy. This has added a lot of rich material to the ongoing quest. Of course, I know you guys are supremely busy, but just keep an eye out. And if you can come and keep joining the conversation and asking your questions to others in the room, it would be wonderful. Next week, it's uh, uh, Umgeni's up uh, with uh, Umgeni. Who you who do you have in the in the chair? Oh, Amy's up. Sorry, Amy. Who do you have in the chair? Um, my guests are Eric uh-huh. of Cal Shakes in uh, in California and Kirtana Kumar of um, the Infinite Souls Theater Farm, theater farm in uh, Karnataka. Yeah, and uh, Kirtana is an amazing human being and she's just written an amazing blog which we should actually post up here for you guys to share about 
what a crazy year she's had. Um, but uh, the drama school is going, drama school Mumbai is going to reconvene in human person in a COVID bubble at her farm in August. Um, and we are currently terrified because we are still mid second wave and some people saying this is an act of insanity. I say it's an act of theater. Um, so I'll leave it at that. We are now, uh, so just uh, this talk is available. Um, all the talks beforehand are available. If you guys wanna be on an ongoing conversation, there is a Telegram group that nobody really talks on, but it's there and you can join it uh, and have chats there. Uh, but beyond that, really, um, just hang out, be off mic, imagine we're at the water cooler, um, and uh, Falguni is putting some interest.